Excellent. Uh, greetings. Good to see everyone uh, here tonight. Welcome. Uh, welcome to our time of worship. We pray that you'll be encouraged as we grow on the word together tonight. Um, again, we welcome Andrew Stewart to the pulpit again. Thank you for your faithful uh, leading us and preaching and opening the word for us, Andrew. Um, just a reminder that uh, next Lord's Day, Williams are here, excellent. Uh, next Lord's Day, uh, both in the morning and evening service, they'll be the, they will be the final two sessions of the Geelong Bible Conference after our morning service. Uh, after our morning service, we're having a bring and share lunch in the hall, uh, but we would encourage everyone to come and be a part of, uh, of that. But also consider, if you haven't already, even now registering for the Geelong Bible Conference, which begins on Friday. Don't forget the Sunday School Adult Bible Class and fellowship groups are in recess over the school term break. Um, but there are, again, including the Geelong Bible Conference, other ways you can participate in the life of the congregation. Um, we'll just take a moment now to prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Yes, thank you, Josh, and uh, just to echo that uh, word of welcome, it's good to see uh, each one of you here tonight. It's a cold night, but uh, God uh, calls us and God is with us. And our, our call to worship tonight is from the book of James, and uh, it is a call to draw near to God. Uh, that, is, that is not a small thing, uh, a trivial thing, not a mechanical thing. Uh, but we do it with all our hearts, our minds, our bodies too. And here's what the Word of God says. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Those words about humbling ourselves maybe are not the, the words that we want to hear, but yet the Word of God does call us to humble ourselves that he may lift us up. And that's exactly what he does as we come uh, into his presence. He shows us our need. He shows us Christ who fills that every need. And Psalm uh, 51 is a psalm that shows the abounding richness of the mercy of God to those who humble themselves, confess their sins, uh, seek the mercy that God offers to us uh, in Christ. God, be merciful to me. On your love I rest my plea. Let's stand as we sing praise to God and we'll remain standing as we Seek God's blessing together in prayer. Let's, let's praise him. Psalm 51a.
Uh, Lord, our, our God, we come to you, the, the God who is holy, exalted, pure, too pure even to uh, look upon sin and evil. And yet, O oh God, we're asking you tonight to draw near to us. And Lord, as we do that, we confess that we have sinned against you. We're children of Adam, our father, in the flesh. Lord, we've inherited his sin, and we've added to his sin many of our own. And Lord, we can make that confession sometimes in a trite and formal way. We can say the words without really acknowledging what they mean. So, Father, we pray tonight that your Spirit would be working amongst us, working to humble us. Lord, where we have grown proud, Lord, humble that pride. Where we have grown arrogant and conceited in what we think are our clever ideas, we pray, O oh God, that you would show us the emptiness of our clever ideas. Show us that we can do nothing, nothing at all, to earn your favor. And Lord, show us that the, the place we need to be is on our knees before you. Lord, that's not a, a message that we naturally warm to. We acknowledge that, O oh God. And yet we ask that you would work in our lives in such a way that we see reality, that we see ourselves as we really are, so that we can see you as you really are and hear the gospel for the message that it actually is, so that we can hear your word and so that your word might penetrate uh, into our hearts, deep into our hearts, and that the healing, cleansing, transforming power of the gospel might really be at work in each and every one of us. Lord, as we bow before you, we pray that you would lift us up, lift us up into yourself, into fellowship with you, that we might know the blessing of what it means to have our lives hidden with Christ in God, that we are not in ourselves but because of Christ, seated in the heavenly realms with Christ. Even as we stand here, even as we worship in this building, Lord, we are in the heavenly. So catch us up, uh, draw us to yourself, draw near to us, and draw us into a closer, deeper walk uh, with you as we worship tonight, but also as we go from here uh, into the rest of this week. And we ask it through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, read uh, from God's Word. Our, our Old Testament reading this evening is from the uh, book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, 4 to 22. Josh, thank you for reading God's Word, and Josh will also be leading us in our uh, prayer of intercession tonight. Uh, reading from Jeremiah chapter 8, in your pew Bibles is on page 807, but it's also there. <clears throat> you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, when men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I have paid attention and listened, but they have not spoken rightly. No man relents of his evil, saying, what have I done? Everyone turns to his own course like a horse plunging headlong into battle. 
Even the stork in the heavens knows her times, and the turtle dove, swallow and crane keep their time, keep the time of their coming. But my people know not the rules of the Lord. How can you say, we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to conquerors, because from the least to the greatest, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. When, would I, when I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, no figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered. And what I gave them has passed away from them. Why do we sit still? Gather together. Let us go into the fortified cities and perish there. For the Lord our God has doomed us to perish and has given us poisoned water to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We looked for peace, but no good came. For a time of healing, but behold, terror. The snorting of their horse, their horses is heard from Dan. At the sound of the neighing of their stallions, the whole land quakes. They come and devour the land and all that fills it, the city and those who dwell in it. For behold, I am sending among you serpents, adders that cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, declares the Lord. My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. Behold the cry of the daughter of my people from the length and breadth of the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and with their foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. I mourn, and dismay has taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? I'm going to pray for us now. Um, as part of uh, things, some of the things I want to pray for includes um, for Derek and Catherine Santabinez and Abraham Naomi Schultink. Abraham and Naomi Schultink have moved back to uh, Geelong um, after being four years up in Mildura, and so it's really good to see them this morning and part of our uh, uh, church family here. So I want to pray for their transition. And uh, one thing I want to mention: the Santabinez, I believe, had a shipping container arrive from the States for which they're very thankful but it's also missing items for which they are concerned so it's, we're going to ask God to be with them so I want to mention that that's the context in that space but let's, uh, let's pray Father in heaven we do uh, come to you now knowing that you are a good and kind God that you are the one who watches over us uh, our going out and our coming in we know that we can look to you and really only look to you uh, for comfort and care and we know that when we do uh, look to you uh, and uh, call upon you, that you do uh, hear us and answer us. We thank you that uh, you, the creator of the universe, um, in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, came near in a particular way uh, and crossed that gap caused by our sin and made possible a right relationship with you. And we uh, thank you uh, that you are the God who has done that, and you're the God that continues to sustain us. And so we do ask, Lord, that you continue to be with us. Forgive us for our sins and teach us how we may follow you. And so we do uh, pray, Lord, for, uh, for the needs that we have or needs that we think we have, uh, things that we want, uh, things that we would desire. And so we do uh, thank you, Lord, for... Um, 
bringing the shipping container across from uh, the United States for the Santa Menez family. However, Lord, uh, significant items are missing and um, that's distressing and um, frustrating and so we pray, Lord, that those items will be recovered soon. We do thank uh, you, Lord, for um, bringing the Santa Menez family, uh, Derek and Catherine and Judah and Ariel and Zara and Declan and Ruby back to Australia and we pray that you continue to care for them and meet all their needs. We think about... Um, uh, think about uh, all the things that they're involved in. Uh, think about um, their physical, mental, uh, emotional, uh, spiritual needs. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to uh, provide for and care for them. We pray too and thank you that Abraham, Naomi, Shultink and Bella and Maya uh, have moved back to Geelong. We pray that you would continue to meet their needs. Uh, there's part of them, Lord, part of their mind, they would prefer to be back in Mildura, but you know what's good for them. And uh, we thank you that they've been able to come back and we pray that you would continue to care for them. Uh, be with them, Lord, as they plan to and think about how they might transition back uh, and assimilate back into life here in Geelong. Thank you that the kids uh, were able to go back to Covenant as well and we pray you continue to meet their needs. Be with Abraham, particularly as he uh, cares for his family and Naomi, um, in particular ways as well. And Lord, we think about uh, others um, around the world. We think about um, our broader church family and, and so we do think about um, Reformed Presbyterian churches uh, around the world. We think of the, the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Chile. Uh, we, th we thank you uh, that they for the plans they have on August, in August to ordain two men to the office of ruling elder. And uh, we do thank you for that and we pray you continue to grow the church in Chile. And we pray for the church in Ireland, uh, Lord, particularly the um, outreach activities by the Loch Brickland congregation and the door-to-door -door work and the men's evangelistic Bible study that they're doing. We pray that there will be good engagement with the local community and these activities would bear fruit. We pray for the church in Japan we do thank you for their church planting um, work around Kobe um, that are being planned for and thought about. We pray that you would give them wisdom to know how they might do that. Um, we pray, Lord, that you continue to grow that church, uh, raise up for them new ruling elders. Um, and we pray that you would uh, bless their witness in that country. We think about the we think about the uh, church uh, in Spain. We pray that you would uh, give uh, give them uh, give them growth. We pray that um, you continue to meet their needs as they think about um, working with the church in Northern Ireland. Uh, people there going from Spain to Ireland to study, but Lord, we pray that you would uh, really care for that congregation. We do think about people around the world. We think about uh, uh, Joel and Ezra as they are over in uh, Portugal um, or heading that direction today. We pray for safety for them. And again, Lord, we know that you're the one that cares for and looks after everyone who travels. We pray that you be with Joel and Ezra these next two and a half weeks. We pray that you would uh, care for them. Uh, pray that this would uh, bond them closer together, grow their understanding of you, I pray, Lord, that they would be able to reflect, both of them, both Joel and Ezra, reflect on your uh, graciousness and kindness to them as they, as they hike over in Portugal. And we think too, Lord, of Warren Peel, who travels this week. And Lord, we travel on aeroplanes and cars and buses and trains, and we take it for granted that we're being cared for. We ought not, because you're the one that uh, protects us. And so we ask your protection for Warren Peel as he travels too. Uh, this week to speak at the Geelong Bible Conference. And we pray, Lord, that you would use him at the Geelong Bible Conference. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us as a congregation, as we are a congregation, as seek to be a congregation that um, speaks and lives the gospel. Uh, grow us as a congregation, we pray, uh, for your glory. Um, continue to listen to us. Uh, be with us as we consider your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing. We're going to sing from Psalm 78a. Uh,
Um, we're going to remain seated uh, as we sing, and we have an opportunity as we sing to return our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Now, this, this psalm, especially stanza three, uh, the, last, the last couple of lines, deals with a, a problem that we're going to be thinking about, and that is people who know God's Word. This is a psalm about passing on, teaching God's Word from one generation to the next, a really, really important ministry. But there's a problem that can be a block that gets in the way, and that is when people hear God's Word, and perhaps even hear it over and over and over again, but pay no attention to it. In other words, it, it, it doesn't actually change them. They, they, they keep it out. Uh, they harden their hearts. So we're thinking about what that actually does and how that, that problem compounds itself and creates many other problems as well. But notice, notice what the psalmist says. They, they would not correct their hearts, nor unto God stay true. So let's praise God as we uh, thank God for His Word that we hear singing Psalm 78a. read together from uh, God's Word in uh, the New Testament in Paul's letter to Titus. Titus uh, chapter 1, we're going to read the first uh, 16 verses. That's actually the, the whole chapter. And if you're following in the Pew Bibles, that's on page uh, 1271. Uh, so let's hear the reading of God's precious and infallible Word. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Christ Jesus for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in His Word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior." To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. 
That is why I left you in Crete, so that you might uh, put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are, are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet uh, of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth to the pure. All things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And we finish our reading at the end of verse 16. Well, this evening I'm returning to a theme that I've been looking at uh, as we've turned to texts in different parts of the Bible, that of the, uh, the conscience. We've seen that the conscience is a gift uh, from God, even if we have to say it's not in itself the voice of God. It's a voice that reminds us of those things that we know about God, things we've learned about God, but, but like every other part of us, it's affected by the fall. We're fallen people. The way we think, the way we feel, the way we talk, the way we act, everything is affected. And our conscience is affected too. It can deceive us. We've seen that already when we looked at Romans uh, chapter 2, how the conscience uh, can sometimes pull us one way, sometimes pull it another. And uh, several weeks ago, we looked at one of the problems of the conscience. In fact, we're looking at three problems. Uh, several weeks ago, we looked at the weak conscience. Uh, we saw that uh, that is the conscience that has not learned uh, knowledge or discernment. But this evening, I want to turn to possibly one of the most troublesome or annoying problems with the conscience uh, and, and I'm calling it the defiled conscience. I'm going to have a few other words to describe it uh, as, we go, as, we, as we go through this evening, but uh, for now we'll stick with that word, the defiled conscience. And the defiled conscience can be a bit like a warning light that's on the blink. Now, we, we know that uh, in lots of other areas we have warning lights on, on our mobile phones, for instance. We have a little sign, and, and usually it's, it's in the shape of a battery, and it tells us when the, the charge is getting low, and when it's getting really low, it goes red, and uh, a sign pops up saying, charge now, or, or whatever your particular device happens to say. So that's a warning sign. Uh, in, in, in a coffee machine, there may be a, a warning sign that says, oh, the hopper's getting low on beans, time to fill up, or time to get some tablets and descale the inside of it. Uh, a warning sign. It's, it, it's, it's saying there's something needs done. 
Or, or in your car, you, you, you have warning signs that say when the fuel's running low or the oil's running low or the battery is, is running low and it needs to be recharged. My car has a, a rather annoying beeping sound, and if I don't plug in my seatbelt, it beeps, 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 and uh, it, it, it makes me, it, it, it compels me uh, by troubling me uh, to make sure I do uh, the right thing. Now, we've looked at that. not all of these warning signs are equally serious. Uh, I mean, nobody is going to die, I think, for want of coffee beans. Some people may care to question that, but I, uh, I, I think I can say you'll, you'll live if you don't have espresso coffee in the morning. You might be slower, but you'll live. So that's, let's put that in the level of, of trivial. Others can be quite annoying, like my uh, beeping in my car when I don't put on the seatbelt the other day. Even when I did put on the seatbelt, it kept beeping. Now, that wasn't the end of the world, but I, I certainly didn't want to drive very far with this, this beep, 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 beep going on. It was, it was annoying. However, other times when those warning signals go on the blink, actually can be very serious. Like you really would not want to run out of petrol when you're crossing the Nullarbor. A pilot on an aeroplane would want to be able to trust the gauges that say whether there's enough fuel, that say what height the aeroplane is at. When those warning signs don't work, planes crash lives are lost, and that is serious. So tonight we happen to be thinking uh, about uh, a really serious problem when it affects uh, our conscience. A defiled conscience can be annoying, and it can be deadly. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at uh, what exactly Paul tried to avoid. Paul, he tells uh, the Roman governor Festus, I always take pains to have a clear conscience. Uh, and the word there for clear conscience is a conscience that does not smite me, a conscience that is not always troubling me, that is not always pecking at me, poking me, uh, turning inside me. He wants to have a clear conscience. And then a a few weeks before that, we looked at the problem in Corinth where uh, some of the, well, there was actually a range of different problems, but some uh, of the believers had a weak conscience. They didn't really understand uh, that idols didn't really exist, that food that may have been eaten in an idol temple or at least uh, offered on a plate in an idol temple was only meat. And Paul addresses that problem. Not all possess this knowledge about uh, what uh, idols really are, but some, through their former association with idols, eat this food as being really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak, in other words, not, not really understanding what is going on, they end up doing things that defile their conscience, that wound their conscience. So here's a case of a weak conscience that is easily defiled. It lacks understanding. It lacks discernment. It hasn't been exercised. Uh, it, it, it hasn't really got a, a, very, a very firm grasp on, on what's right and wrong according to the Word of God. But tonight, uh, we're turning to a passage that, while it speaks about a defiled conscience, speaks about a much more troubling example of a defiled conscience. We find it in those last two verses of uh, Titus chapter 1. Uh, those who both minds and consciences are defiled. And this person is in serious trouble. This is the person who persists in doing what is wrong, who's been challenged, who knows it's wrong, refuses to repent, and keeps 
on sinning and, and feels it and feels the weight and burden of that in their heart and soul. And they're upset by it and they're struggling with it and it's weighing them down. It's a bit like someone, and I think I did use this illustration before, so forgive me if I'm using it again, but it's a bit like someone who knows, who just knows that their, 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 their constitution cannot cope with spicy curries, but yet loves a spicy curry. So they take it and they feel unwell. And then they take another one and they feel even more unwell. In fact, they keep taking it to the point where their insides really just feel uh, rotten. That's the kind of persistence that Paul is describing here. The person who persists in doing what they know to be wrong and are burdened, burdened by that fact. So let's uh, let's take a closer look uh, at the defiled conscience. First of all, uh, let's think uh, about uh, its nature. What is it? It's the conscience of a person who persists in sin, who persists in doing what that person knows to be wrong, and who is wounded by doing what they know to be wrong. This is another illustration that we have uh, in the New Testament. A defiled conscience is a wounded conscience. Paul speaks about someone who pierces themselves with many griefs. So there's a big overlap between a, a defiled conscience and a wounded or lacerated or crushed uh, conscience. Now, in this passage uh, that we're looking at, let's just take a, a look at the context. Paul is contrasting uh, two groups. There's the pure on the one hand and the defiled on the other. So, I've got to try to understand. The pure person has a clear conscience. The defiled has a wounded conscience. Uh, so, let's try to distinguish these two groups. Who is uh, the pure? To the pure, all things are pure. This is the person who has believed the gospel, the person who knows that they're a sinner, who's asked God to forgive their sin, the person who is sensitive to the fact that they're a sinner, who's sensitive to God's Word, who, who's active in, in seeking God's leading, God's guidance, show me thy ways, O Lord, your path, teach to me, uh, the person who is conscientious in seeking to do what God wants them to do. They know that they're not acceptable to God because they are pure. They know that they're acceptable to God because Christ is righteous. They know that they're not perfect, but they know that God is gracious, and God is wise, and God is merciful. Like Paul, they can say, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's a person who is trusting in God, who is following God's lead, who is conscientiously seeking God's ways. And Paul says here, to the pure, all things are pure. Now, what he really means here is, is everything that is good is pure. He's not saying that sinful things are okay. He's saying that created things are okay. Everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. So, that includes food and drink. To the pure, it's pure. That includes work and rest. I mean, so long as it's not a sinful job, so long as you're not being lazy, these things are pure. To the pure, all things are pure. Marriage is pure. Sex within marriage is pure. To the pure, all things are pure. I know some people who uh, sometimes feel guilty if they take a break and go on a holiday, they feel that they're somehow uh, being lazy. Do not feel lazy. To the pure, 
all things are pure. Jesus said to his disciples, come aside, take a break. God has given us a day to rest. God knows that we need work and we need rest. To the pure, all of these things, these everyday things, all the good things that he has given to us, we enjoy them and they are pure. However, the defiled person, uh, nothing is pure. This is the person who carries around a, uh, a burden of guilt, who doesn't examine himself in the mirror of God's Word, who doesn't come to the cross seeking forgiveness, when convicted and challenged by what he hears from God's Word, does not go to Christ, does not ask for forgiveness, does not seek to change. So what do they do? The burden builds. It just gathers up. It's like your kitchen bin, and you keep throwing rubbish into it, and you never take it out. And even when it's full, you, you just stuff more and more rubbish into it to the point where it overflows. And there it is, month after month after month, and the garbage at the bottom is absolutely rotten. And there it is, and it's building up. That's the person who doesn't come to Christ. In fact, Paul says his mind, both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Now, really, that's Paul's way of describing the heart. In a sense, two sides uh, of the heart. And I'm not talking about uh, the, the chambers of the heart. I'm talking about what makes up our, our, our inner being. Our mind is what we think. Our, our conscience is, is how we think about ourself, how we feel. Our mind is how we think and reason. Our conscience is how we feel about ourselves. So notice, notice the double effect of guilt here in the heart. And it's a heart problem. First of all, guilt warps the way this person thinks. That's what sin does. You know, you hear people say, oh, so-and-so, they're not thinking straight. They're not rational. Well, sin does that. Sin warps the way we think. Now, I'm not saying sinful people can't be clever people or uh, do complicated mathematics. They can. But when it comes to making the really important judgments in life, Jesus says, judge righteous judgment. Sin gets in the way of doing that. The burden of guilt means that we can't and we don't make good decisions in life. As a result, we make some very bad decisions, and they pile up, and they pile up. So guilt warps the way people think, but guilt also warps the way we feel about ourselves. The conscience is that part within us that feels pain when we think about what we have done. The defiled person is a person whose ability to feel pain is still alive and active, but is doing nothing to seek help with that pain. They feel damaged, broken. I remember someone once saying to me about their past life, I feel like damaged goods. It's a tremendously sad thing when you hear people speaking and thinking about themselves in that way. So, focusing on the conscience, it's important to bear in mind that um, there are these two reasons uh, why a person may feel uh, defiled. On the one hand, we have the, uh, the, the, the weak believer who uh, feels defiled even when they haven't done anything that's wrong. They may have eaten some food and feel uncomfortable about it. That's the First Corinthians 8 situation. And then there's the First Titus 1 situation where Paul is describing something 
much more serious. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their actions. So let me just summarize that. There's the 1 Corinthians 8, burdened by false guilt, and the Titus 1, crushed by real guilt. So that's the nature of a defiled conscience. And it's important to make that distinction. Because when we come to seeking a remedy, we've got to know the problem if we're going to apply the right remedy. So we'll come to that later. But let's, uh, let's look a little more at, at some of the symptoms and some of the, the causes. First of all, or secondly, uh, the causes. Uh, what is it that defiles a person's conscience. Well, first of all, we've got to ask, what is it that defiles a person? And it's not illness. Back in New Testament times, people thought lepers were defiled people. That's why they, uh, they, 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 they kept them in colonies outside. There, 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 there is nothing in illness that defiles us. There is nothing in physical illness. There is nothing in mental illness that defines us or defiles us. It's not what we eat or drink that defiles us. It's not what we wear. It's, it's not the neighborhood we live in. It's not the background that we come from. These are not things that defile us. It's, it's not the people that we talk to or spend time with. Jesus went into the homes of sinners. He touched lepers. He spent time with the outcasts and remained perfectly pure. Jesus makes it clear that it's not stuff outside of us. It's not people outside of us. It's not things that we eat or drink. It's what's already in us. It's the heart. And here I'm thinking of what he said in Mark uh, chapter 7. There is nothing outside a person by going into him that can defile him, but the things that come out of a person from within, out of the heart of man. That's where defilement uh, comes from. And that's why uh, in uh, this verse, Paul is speaking about the minds and consciences, those two components of the heart. That's, that's where the problem lies. So what is it that defiles the heart? Because whatever defiles the heart is what defiles the conscience. And the Bible teaches that every one of us, every one of us, is born with a defiled heart, a sinful heart. Now, uh, Jeremiah describes it as a, a stubborn and rebellious heart or a, a deceitful heart. Ezekiel calls it the, the heart of stone. And all of that can be traced way back to Adam, our first father, when he sinned, when he fell, in the day that you eat, you will die. Now, Adam didn't, Adam didn't drop physically dead, but his heart went stone dead. That's where, the, that's where the, the heart of stone came from. Adam, our father, when he sinned, his sin has passed on to us. And ever since... The fool says in his heart that there is no God. The fool lives as if in his heart he believes there is no God. Jeremiah uses uh, the uh, illustration of wounds and, uh, and wounding. We saw it in chapter 8. Here's a few examples from, from chapter 6. And he's speaking about the condition of the nation of Israel. Uh, violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. Of course, people try and find a way out of that. Almost any way, they try to find coping mechanisms. And inevitably, they turn out not to work. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, where there is no peace. Now, God has a message of peace for the wounded. 
But they were not preaching it. They were not taking the people. The prophets of Jeremiah's day were not taking people back to God in repentance and trust. They were offering healing that didn't work. Now, Jeremiah is using the language of wounding. Paul is using the language of defilement. But, but the message is, is, is pretty much the same. A defiled heart is a wounded heart. A defiled conscience is one that has been pierced with many times, many griefs, and it hurts, and it festers, and the symptoms are many. So let's take a look at, at what Paul says uh, about uh, the symptoms. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Nothing, nothing is pure. Now, just, just get a sense of that. Everything, everything they do, if, 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 if you have fallen in the mud and you pick yourself up, and you're covered head to toe in mud, and you go and pick something up, you're going to defile it. Because everything about you, every part of your body is covered in mud, and everything you touch is going to get dirty. And uh, the book of Proverbs gives some examples. Even the, the sacrifices of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Now, the sacrifice here is the sacrifice and worship. The sacrifice that the wicked person brings to the Lord in the temple is wicked because it's coming from a wicked heart. Now, there's different ways of translating the next verse, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging one. Haughty eyes, a proud heart. Well, we know that those are wrong, but the plowing of the wicked something as everyday and ordinary and necessary and good as plowing your field, even that, says the book of Proverbs, is wicked for the person whose heart is wicked. And Isaiah puts it most bluntly, we have become all like one who is unclean, even our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. That's the reality. To the defiled, nothing, nothing is pure. Now, now, some people are blissfully unaware of that. In fact, many people carry on their lives without realizing that. And that might be because their consciences haven't been taught. They know nothing of God's Word. Or, or it might be, on the other hand, they've reached the point where their conscience is hardened. And later on in God's time, God's providence, we're going to think about what a seared conscience is, a hardened, burnt conscience. But in between those two, there are many who are all too aware of what's going on in their hearts and how that's flowing into their lives. They know they know God, or, or, or at least they know about God. They hear that echo of God's Word in their hearts. Now, it might be an echo of what their parents taught them. It might be an echo of what their Sunday school teacher taught them. It might be an echo of something they heard at church. It might be a, a, a friend who has been witnessing to them or speaking to them, and they might remember that. They might be remembering it years later. They know, they know, and that is why their conscience is wounded and it leaves them feeling defiled. Now, what are the results of that? Well, there can be many results of that. Sometimes people can feel anxious and fearful even though they can't ever quite put their finger on, on what, what exactly the problem is. Now, now let me be clear about this. There, there, there are many, many reasons why people can be anxious. Many reasons why people can be anxious. And many reasons why people can be, can be fearful. Reasons that have nothing to do with a, a defiled conscience. But let's bear in mind that this is one possibility. And a possibility, I think, that we 
we sweep away too quickly. Maybe some of our anxieties are our conscience bubbling to the surface. The person who has that defiled conscience very often jumps to the conclusion that everybody else around them is judging them, looking down their noses at them, gossiping about them, when in reality it's their own conscience that's accusing them. The person with the defiled conscience often has a, a defense mechanism, and it's called being judgmental of others, especially Christians. They're often angry people, prickly people, people who struggle to form wholesome relationships with, uh, with others. Their behavior can become obsessive as they try to clean up the outside of their lives, ignoring the mess that's going on inside. As kind of an example of that, Shakespeare speaks about Lady Macbeth, who with her husband killed the King of Scotland. And in her sleep, even in her sleep, she's talking about what she has done, and, and she, she rubs and rubs and rubs and rubs and rubs her hand obsessively trying to get the, 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 the blood, as it were. She had no blood left. It's gone, but, but she keeps doing it. She's obsessive and cries out even in her sleep, all the perfumes of Arabia will never sweeten this little hand. That's what I mean by obsessive behavior that flows out of a defiled conscience. And yet, what are all of these? They're coping mechanisms, and they do not deal with the real problem. They see what's defiling their conscience, but continue to inflict the wounds upon themselves that disfigure themselves. And so, verse 16 is, is devastating. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work, unable to, un to, to, to undo the damage. Now, is there, any, is there any hope in a situation like that? Is Jeremiah asked, is, is, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there. Why then has the health of my wounded people not been restored? Well, the good news is that there is a remedy. Paul doesn't address it here, but I want to try to set out what it actually is in the light of what Paul tells us in these, in these verses. And I'll tell you what it's not, ignoring it. Ignoring it doesn't make it go away. Medicating it only dulls it. Self-help, you're kidding yourself. Simply resolving to not do it again doesn't undo the problems of the past. It may stop the bleeding, but it doesn't heal the wound. The problem of a defiled conscience lies in the heart, and only God, through His gospel, can deal with the hearts. And the heart treatment we need is to be born again, that is, born from above, born from outside of ourselves. And when we're born again, God draws us to Christ, and we acknowledge our problem. Against you, you only have I sinned. We acknowledge God's solution. We put our trust in Jesus. And He is the one who is able to make us clean. That was a lesson that Peter learned. You might have thought that Peter would have worked this out spending three years with Jesus. But no, Jesus had to send them a vision from heaven. You remember the vision that comes down and all these unclean, unclean animals are on it. And the voice says, take and eat. And Peter says, never. And the voice says, do not call 
common, what God has made clean. And of course, what Jesus was saying to Peter was, go and preach in the house of the Gentile, unclean Cornelius. And years later, when Paul, oh, sorry, when Peter is in Jerusalem, he reflects on it, he, he speaks about it uh, in uh, Acts chapter 15. He says, brothers, you know that in the early days of the gospel, God made a choice that by my mouth, the Gentiles, those people that we thought of as unclean, would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, that's faith in Christ. That's faith in Jesus. That's how their hearts are made clean. Now, let's drill into that a little bit more, specifically in the death of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood of Jesus on the cross. That is what cleanses our hearts. Faith in Jesus who was crucified, who shed his blood that our sins might be forgiven. Hebrews uh, chapter 9 really connects this to the conscience. He says, uh, the writer to the Hebrews says, the blood of goats, the blood of sacrificial animals, they do not make the conscience clean. But the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, it purifies our conscience from dead works. Those are all those death-imparting works, all of those wounds that we inflict, wound upon wound upon our soul. The blood of Jesus is able to wash it away. Now, how does the blood of Jesus work? Well, it, it works in, in, in two ways. First of all, the blood of Jesus pays the penalty. The death of Jesus pays the price. Our sins make us debtors. Jesus pays the price. His death pays the debt that we cannot pay so that we might be declared righteous. Now, that's justification. But the blood of Jesus, amazingly, doesn't stop there. The blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us. And that's the sense of the verb here, the word here. The blood of Jesus, 1 John 1 verse 7, cleanses us. It keeps on cleansing us. Now, justification is an act. God declares us when we believe, the moment we believe, we are declared to be righteous. But the grace of God keeps on going. The grace of God keeps on changing us. The grace of God keeps on instructing us that our minds are renewed. The grace of God keeps on changing us so that our lives and our characters are being renewed. Now, that's sanctification. And those are not just big technical words. Those are words that help us. Uh, they're, they're like magnifying glasses. They, they help us to see exactly in detail what God has done for us. So when God declares our sins forgiven, He's dealing with a defiled conscience. When the Holy Spirit keeps working to change us, to transform us, to sanctify us, He's dealing with a defiled conscience. He's binding up the wounds. He's, he's you're cleaning out the dirt. You know, sometimes when uh, you fall and uh, maybe you, you, you get all kinds of soil and dirt and rubbish in your wound, you, you, need, you need to wash it out so that the wounds can heal. That's what sanctification does. It washes out the wound. It flushes out the dirt. It binds it up. It puts in the ointment of the grace of the gospel into those wounds that they might heal. 
I've spoken to people who have told me that they're almost ashamed to go back and ask God to forgive them yet again. I don't know whether that's been your experience. You've sinned, you've asked forgiveness, you've fallen, you've sinned again, you've asked forgiveness. And it gets to the point sometimes when some people almost give up. They think, how, how can I do this? How can God even listen to me as I do this? Remember this. The grace of God that declares you righteous is the grace of God that also sanctifies. So do go back. And when you do fall into sin again, do go back to Him. Do go back to Christ. Do ask for mercy. Do ask for forgiveness. But, but ask, ask for this as well. As well as asking for forgiveness, ask God to make you holy. Ask for holiness. Ask for sanctification. Ask God to change you as well as forgiving you. You see, together our justification and our sanctification is the ointment that heals a defiled conscience. So when Jeremiah asks his question, is there a balm in Gilead? Is there one who can heal? The answer is a resounding, yes, there is. Because in Jesus, we are justified, declared not guilty, but by the grace of Jesus, His Spirit working in us, we are sanctified. So it's the fullness of the gospel, the wholeness of the gospel, the richness of the grace of God in Christ that is the remedy for a defiled conscience. Whether you're a weak Christian who needs to grow, or whether you're someone who isn't a Christian, it's the fullness of the gospel that is a remedy for that troubling, grumbling, piercing conscience. Praise God. Come to Christ. He's the healer, and His gospel is the ointment. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we, uh, we thank You that uh, You are the great physician, the, the wonderful physician. Lord, there is healing in Your words there is healing in your hands. There is healing in your grace. And Lord God, we, we often wound ourselves. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we're very aware of it. But we pray, O oh God, that you would keep drawing us back to you, our healer and our Savior. And in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing. We're going to sing from... Uh, Psalm uh, 51, Selection D, and we do plead with God to be gracious, to hide His face from our sins, to renew us within and without. So let's stand as we uh, praise God, singing Psalm 51D.
And now as we go, we go with God's blessing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Now to...